You know, we're not going to go into the history of all the prophets per se, just the ones who impacted history a lot, right? So like uh, Jeremiah, for example, he was a prophet to, you know, kings of his day, but his actions didn't specifically uh, trigger events in history the way that Daniel did, for example, or the way that David did, for example. So we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, Daniel, the third chapter. It says, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was uh, 60 cubits. All right, so that would be uh, each cubit is a foot and a half. So that would be 90 foot tall. Crazy. Whose height was uh, three score cubits. And the breadth thereof, six cubits. And so, uh, again, one and a half. So that would be nine foot. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Right? He, he's making all his subjects worship himself and this image of himself. All right. Then the princes, the governors, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I suppose it doesn't say uh, that it is an image of him. I'm, I'm assuming that, I suppose. It could be one of the Babylonian gods. Right? Um, then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O people, nations and lands, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, Flute, harp, stack, butt, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. So it's like a, a, a national anthem. Uh, like you, you have a, a directions that you're supposed to follow whenever this music plays. So it's, it's similar to that. All right. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, worshipeth shall at the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Right, you get put to death, thrown in the fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, bucks, altar, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So this is similar to uh, when we talk about like Greece and the way that they changed the laws of the land and everybody started following after the Greeks when they were in power. It's the same thing here. The, the other nations outside the nation of Israel don't have a real God, so they are willing to serve whoever. But the Israelites are not so, especially those who are righteous. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, respectively. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. That, uh, you may think, well, what about Daniel? Is Daniel worshiping this image? But based upon the last chapter, we can uh, assume, we can infer that Daniel was in a position, a place where he didn't have to bow down. He was in a position, in a place where he was like second in, in all of Babylon. He, he only ever listened to Nebuchadnezzar. The, Nebuchadnezzar's men cannot force him to do anything. But Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they can pick on them because they don't have that status that Daniel had. All right. Said these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. 
well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So he, he's a uh, He's tempting God with that last phrase. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. They said, Look, we're not even cautious about answering you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. So they said, Look, we know God is able to deliver us up out of your hands, out of that fire. And even if he don't, we're still not going to worship him. Or we're still not going to worship your gods. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because initially he called him in and he's like, I don't want to have to do this to you, right? King Nebuchadnezzar was like, tell me that this was a mistake, right? Tell me that you have been worshiping this image. He didn't want to he didn't want to get rid of them because he he knew from their interactions with him that they were wise counselors as well. Maybe not on the level of Daniel, at least not at this point, but they were still wise counselors as well. He didn't want to get rid of them. They were useful to him. All right. Um, therefore, he spake, but now his visage has changed because they answered him roughly and said, look, we're not going to serve your gods. Uh, therefore, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace on uh, one seven times more than it was wont to be heated, right? So seven times more, seven times hotter. He said, throw, throw all, all the wood off the fire, right? And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the uh, fiery furnace, into the burning fiery furnace. So uh, not only did he throw them in there, he tied them together so they can't escape once he throws them in there. They can't run and jump out. Right. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hoses, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Like, uh, I just want to point this out because uh, a lot of times this verse is used to show, as it says, hosen right here. That's a German word for pants, right? So a lot of people talking about, well, ain't nobody wore pants back then. Ain't nobody, uh, everybody wore dress. No, they did not. The Israelite men wore pants, all right? They ain't wear togas. That's Greek and Roman men. Um, their hosen, their hats, other garments. But anyway, they were cast into the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the ones who, his mighty men, his most mighty men from his army, were just killed due to the pride of the king and his anger and his emotions. If they hadn't heated it up seven times more, then those men would still be alive. Not today, but you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the, uh, unto the king, True, O king. But he, so, Nebuchadnezzar stood up, and he's shocked. That's what astonished, uh, astonished, the same as astonished. He's like, I thought we threw three men in there. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So that tells you right there who was in that, uh, who was in that fiery furnace with those men, with those three men. It was Jesus Christ. All right? Um. So, so yeah, not only it said they're walking around in there. So that Christ came in there, and first thing he did, he let them loose so that they could walk around and talk in there. All right? If they could see him, right? Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. <laughs> right, so Nebuchadnezzar saying, come on, step on out. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and king's counselors being gathered together saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power. 
nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. So they didn't even smell like smoke. None of their clothes was burnt. None of their hair was burnt. All right. So the fire did not touch them at all. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and hath changed the king's word and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Right? So even Nebuchadnezzar has to recognize at this point, okay, the god of these Jews, the god of these righteous Israelites, you can't touch him. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after the sword. Right? So he recognized, look, everybody else will try to defy me. I throw them in the fire and they burn up. Right? Their God does not protect them. But the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's a different God. That's a real God. All right? Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon, right? So uh, in the Apocrypha, you read the uh, the Song of the Three Holy Children. That's more about a prayer. That's more prophecy. And uh, that's why we're not getting into it into history, but uh, read it on your own time. All right. Going on to chapter four in Daniel. Still on Nebuchadnezzar. Starting with verse one. Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. All right, so this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar has to humble down here. That's why he's writing this letter. He was forced to humble down, and he's about to get into that story. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Right? Uh... Their, none of their answers satisfied Nebuchadnezzar. All right. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Now, obviously, he's he's speaking of uh, multiple gods because he is a Babylonian, a pagan, right? Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much. And in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. All right, so that's a uh, that's an angel. He cried aloud and said, Thus, hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from a man, so that which you know this tree is talking about, it's talking about a man. And let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it, give it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basis of men. This dream, 
Yeah, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof. For as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make, excuse me, to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able. For the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Verse 19, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astounded for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Right, so Daniel was a bit nervous to tell Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream. He's saying, look, you're not going to like it. Your enemies are going to like this. You're not going to like it. All right. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowl of the heaven had their habitation, it is thou, O king, that it's you, Nebuchadnezzar, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. Verse 24, this is the interpretation of king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Right, so... The uh, the pride. Daniel is letting Nebuchadnezzar know your pride is getting the best of you. God has to humble you so that you know he is the only true God. All right. You're trying to get his servants to worship gold statues. He don't like that. All right. Uh, give it to him. Verse 26. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Right? So Daniel's trying to give him the advice. Look, turn to the Lord now. He may delay this. He may change his mind on this. Turn to God now and do righteousness. Right? Give to the poor. Right. Break off your sins, right? Verse 28. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Yeah. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Right? So it's a year later, and he still thinking he, you know, He's that guy. He's like, I'm him. I did this. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. Right, so so God had enough. It's here. Because <laughs> God brings up Babylon. This is what uh, I brought out a couple weeks ago. God only raised up Babylon because of what Hezekiah had showed the Babylonians everything in his house. And so the prophecy was, okay, the Babylonians are going to come and take everything out of your house. So God is the one who raised up the Babylonians. All right? So he, the Lord is hearing Nebuchadnezzar talking about, I did this and I did that. And he said, no, no more. I've had enough. All right? Verse 32. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Right, there's another scripture that says he raised up the basest men, 
and sets them in positions of authority. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but the uh, the scripture talking about he, he raises up princes from the dung hills, right? He give it to whomsoever he will. Verse 32. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird claws, right? So he uh his hair all over his body grew like it was feathers, and his his nails got so long he didn't groom himself. Real nasty stuff here. And at the end of the days, and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. Right? So he lost his mind. Being uh being feral like this, he lost his mind. Until one day, he just he just got it all back. And I blessed the most high, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. They, they have a reputation of nothing. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Nobody can stop God from doing what he has in his plans to do. All right. Even though many people try to go according to their own ways and try to stop God's plan. No. You ain't stopping God's plan. All right? Verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, and my and brightness returned unto me. My counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. All whose works are truth and his ways just, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. That was the moral of the story here. Nebuchadnezzar said, yeah, I learned my lesson. If you walk in pride, the God of Israel will abase you, will bring you down to nothing. All right. Uh, it said seven times. I'm assuming that means seven years. I guess it could be you know, seven weeks, seven months. It doesn't really say what the times are. I'm assuming it's years. Like I said, it could be months, you know. I don't think it ever specified. It just said seven times. But we'll keep it moving. We'll keep it moving. Daniel 5. Uh, verse 1. Belshazzar, so Belshazzar being the uh, one of the successors, one of the descendants of Nebuchadnezzar. The king, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which is in Jerusalem. All right, so yeah. Well, when it says father in the scriptures, it could mean uh, you know, father. It could mean grandfather. It just means you know, descendant. So it could be his dad, but it could also be his granddad or. Um, he's in Jerusalem. Uh, okay, yeah, right here. That the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. And this goes back to uh, what I was saying a couple of weeks ago. Whenever Nebuchadnezzar took the vessels, he didn't smell them down and just like use the gold. He just had them in storage. All right. Um. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives, his concubines, drank in them, right? So uh, they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and stone. All those uh, Babylonian gods they were worshiping. While drinking out of the holy vessels that were of the temple in Jerusalem, which they had stolen, which Nebuchadnezzar and his men had stolen. All right, verse 5. In the same hour came forth... Uh, fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So imagine, imagine this. You just see, you don't see nothing but fingers writing. That's all you see. You don't see nothing but fingers writing on the wall. 
Um, then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his knees smote one against. So he's literally like shivering, shivering in fear, right? Knees <laughs> clattering together. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers of the king's state, and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof, shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. I'm assuming that it's after the king and queen. Then came in then came in all, all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his courts were astounded. All right, so they, they, they didn't know they didn't know what it said. All right. Much less like what that means. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house. And the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, is found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Right, so the queen was actually uh, somewhat intelligent. Right, she knew the history. Oh, there is this one counselor that isn't Babylonian that that you didn't bring in here that knows more than all the Babylonians, according to you know what what your father said. All right. Then was Daniel brought in before the king, and the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou that Daniel which art the which art of the children of the captivity of Judah? Whom the king, my father, brought out of Jeru. I have even heard of thee, that the spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. And now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But they cannot show the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of thee, that thou can make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou can read the writing, Make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about thy neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Even though in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel was already in a position like that. But as his foolish son came, as Nebuchadnezzar's foolish son got the throne, he started putting his buddies and the Babylonian astrologers in, in the positions like that. So now Daniel got to work his way back up, essentially. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gift be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. So, so Daniel's like, look, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm not going to sit by your side while your kingdom gets taken. No. It, it's clear that you are not going to last. Uh, what's his name? Belshazzar? Uh... O thou king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would sl whom he would he slew, and whom he would and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast. And his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Excuse me, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth, it, appointeth over it whomsoever he will. I want you to notice again how... Anytime the Babylonians speak about Daniel, they're like, oh, he has the spirit of the holy gods, plural. But every time Daniel speaks, he said, look, I serve the most high God. Daniel never refers to himself as having multiple gods. That's how the Babylonians look at him because that's their mindset. That's their mindset. 
that there is a whole bunch of gods and stuff. And Daniel has the spirit of all of them, whatever. But Daniel, he said, look, this is the way you go. The most high God. That's it. That's who you serve. That's who you worship. All right. But, you know, these Babylonians don't want to listen. Um, and that he points over, he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this, right? So, so Belshazzar would have been, you know, sitting in the wings watching what happened to Nebuchadnezzar if he was wise, if he had paid attention, right? But he was probably out partying or something, didn't even notice. Mm. But has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver, and gold of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. So Daniel knows. He's like, look, you crossed the line whenever you started taking the holy vessels to worship your pagan gods that don't exist. You crossed the line with God. That's when he started writing on your wall. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel of Tarsus. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Like Mene, 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 number, number. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances, art found wanting or lacking. Right? So number, number, balance. Perez. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Right? So it's like written on the walls like number, number, balance, Persians. Number, number, balance, Perez. Right? Or a parson. So, it's, it's what you see, it was literally the writing on the wall. Uh, that's probably where they get that expression from. The writing on the wall here is that the Persians are going to take the kingdom. From these Babylonians. Well, the Medes and the Persians, they had a coalition. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Three score and three, that's 62 years old. All right. So this is probably the most famous, if, if not uh, if not the, the burning the fiery furnace, because that didn't have anything to do with Daniel. This is probably the most famous thing, most famous story about Daniel. It's here in Daniel 6. This is where we get to uh, Daniel and the lions again. All right. And I'm going to start with verse 1. It pleased Darius to send over the kingdom. 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage, right? So you'd, you'd oftentimes uh, see this in the ancient world. The counselors, even if you're in a new, even if uh, it's a new regime, if, if it's a new uh you know, race of people ruling, they would still use the counselors from the old empire. They would take those counselors and say, okay, we're, we're, we're still going to use you as a counselor, right, as long as you, you know, stay in line, right? So Darius was wise enough to do this with Daniel and put him in a very prominent position. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. He was blameless. All right? For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So not only was he honest, but he didn't make mistakes. And that's crazy, especially when you're dealing with this type of business. He didn't make no kind of mistakes. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they said, look, as long as Daniel's keeping 
the law of his God, there's not we can't touch it. It's gonna prosper. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Right, so uh, a lot of people would be able to see this as a plot or a trick in some kind of way. But them, them Medes and the Persians, bro, and, and this is uh, something that, that you see in other in other books in the Bible as well. And maybe we'll get into it in a, uh, in a couple weeks or so. But these Medes and these Persians, man, they were easily influenced. They weren't they weren't the, the brightest bulb in the pack, if you know what I mean. Alright. Not any of them. <laughs> None of them were. Even Cyrus, and we're gonna get into Cyrus here in a minute. Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his window being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four times. So Daniel didn't stop his routine. His routine was to pray three times a day. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh this petition three times a day. And like they don't, the, the, the phrasing in that, I know that, you know, it's, it's, if any man prays to a God, and that's where they're getting into because he's praying, but asking of, uh, or making a petition to anybody is like asking for something. We don't know for sure that Daniel was asking for things. Um, he could have just been giving thanks, right? But that uh, they are trying to catch him on anything, right? So, um, verse fourteen. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. So even the king is now ashamed of himself because he fell for the plot of his other counselors. Right, his other noblemen. All right. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, now Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which is king which the king established may be changed. Which first of all, dumb rule. I'm just gonna say it. But like I said about these Medes and Persians, they were not the smartest group of people. Then the king commanded them and brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, will deliver thee. Because uh, Darius had heard the stories. He had heard how uh, Daniel's God is a true God. And he's not like the gods of the nations. He will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. And with the signet of his lords, so they all they all sealed it with their rings, right? That the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel, right? So uh, they they all sealed it just in case you know somebody wanted to come sneak him out, or just in case the king wanted to change his mind and come get him. All right. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Right? So he ain't eat nothing that night. Neither were instruments of music brought before him. And his sleep went from him. So he stayed up all night. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he come to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. So first of all, this, uh, this saying, O king, live forever. That shows that Daniel is not trying to like step outside King Darius. 
as they're trying to accuse him of, right? He just knows that God is more important than the king, but he, the king is still important, right? Just not on the level of the Most High God. My God has sent his angels and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. He said, look, I ain't do nothing against you. This is your, your nobleman, right? Then the king, then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. So they, they weren't playing around. They're all their family. The whole family. Go ahead. And the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So none of them people even touched the ground. The lions were so hard. They ain't eat nothing. They ain't eat nothing in a day. Right? <laughs> they couldn't eat Daniel. They were told not to. So here's some other people. All right, bet. Eat them up. Then the king Darius wrote unto all people, nations and languages, as well in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So so one thing, I know I've been uh, you know, talking uh talking dirty on these uh Medes and Persians. But one thing about these Medes and Persians and even uh with simple people in general, because I, I have been saying that they were not the brightest. But the good thing about simple people, about people who don't know, is that they're more willing to learn like these Medes and Persians did, right? They, they were pretty slow, right? I've said it. They, they were pretty dumb, easily influenced, but that means they're more easily influenced to the right way, right? So just because I say somebody's easily influenced or even simple, that doesn't necessarily mean it's all bad, right? So um, I want to finish out this last verse. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. All right. But see, this is the last history that we get in Daniel. Right? Because you, you go to the next chapter and it goes back to uh, in the first year of Belshazzar and it goes into prophecy. Right? We're not necessarily going to get into that because uh, this is Bible history 101. This isn't you know, dissecting prophecy or whatever. So um, I want you to keep that in mind. It said he... he up until Cyrus, right? It's at verse 21 in, in the first chapter of Daniel. It says, and Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. But we don't read that history here in the book of Daniel. So where can we find that history? In the Apocrypha. It's one of them books or one of them chapters that the Greeks destroyed. But they made a copy of it. Right here, Bell and the Dragon. All right, Bell and the Dragon. And King Astyages was gathered to his fathers, and Cyrus of Persia received his kingdom. Right, so Darius died, and now here's Cyrus. And Daniel conversed with the king and was honored above all his friends. Why is that? Because Cyrus continued the tradition of Darius. Now, the Babylonians had an idol called Baal, and there were spent upon him every day twelve great measures of fine flour, forty sheep, and six vessels of wine. And the king worshipped it and went daily to adore it. But Daniel worshipped his own god, and the king said unto him, Why dost not thou worship Baal? Who answered and said, Because I may not worship idols made with hands, but the living God who hath created the heavens and the earth and hath sovereignty over all flesh. So Daniel, so, so Cyrus asked him, why don't you worship Baal? And Daniel's like, because uh, that's an idol. It's not real. I serve the only one and living God. Then said the king unto him, thinkest thou not that Baal is the living God? Seest thou 
not how much he eateth and drinketh every day, right? Because they're doing these sacrifices and, and Baal is eating up this food that they're bringing every day. Then Daniel smiled and said, O king, be not deceived, for this is but clay within and brass without, and did never eat or drink anything. So Daniel's like, oh, that's like, <laughs> that's like hearing that like a, a, an adult believes in Santa Claus or something. You're like, oh, <laughs> you still believe in that thing? Right? So Daniel's like, look, this thing can't eat. This, this is made out of clay and brass. It can't eat nothing. So the king was wroth and called for his priest and said unto them, if you tell me not who this is that devoureth through the senses, you shall die. So Cyrus got pissed. He said, look, y'all playing me for a fool. But if you can certify me that Baal devoureth them, then Daniel shall die. For he hath spoken blasphemy against Baal. And Daniel said unto the king, let it be according to thy word. Right? Daniel's not worried at all because he knows this trick. Right? He's been around these Babylonians enough to know what's going on here. All right. Now the priests of Baal were 70, beside their wives and children. And the king went with Daniel into the temple of Baal. Right? So there were 70 priests of Baal plus all their wives and kids. So Baal's priest said, Lo, we go out, but thou, O king, set on the meat, and make, make ready the wine, and shut the door fast, and seal it with thine own signet. And tomorrow, when thou comest in, if thou findest not that Baal hath eaten up all, we will suffer death, or else Daniel that speaketh falsely against us. Right? So they said, Okay, king, go ahead and uh go ahead and lock the door yourself. Put your signet on it and everything, right? And they little regarded it, for under the table they had made a privy entrance, whereby they entered in continually and consumed those things. Right? So they had a little back door. So, yeah, King, go ahead and lock that door. Put your seal on it and everything. It won't be broken tomorrow. Because they got a little back door they can sneak through. So when they were gone forth, the king set meats before Baal. Now Daniel had commanded his servants to bring ashes, and those they strewed throughout all the temple in the presence of the king alone. Then went they out and shut the door and sealed it with the king's signet and so departed. Now in the night came the priests with their wives and children as they were wont to do and did eat and drink of all. Right? So at, at night time, that's, uh, that's when they go in and feast. In the morning, the time, the king arose and Daniel went with him. Right? So it was early in the morning. And the king said, Daniel, are the seals whole? And he said, Yea, O king, they be whole. And as soon as he had opened the door, the king looked upon the table and cried with a loud voice, Great art thou, O Baal, with thee is no deceit at all. Right? So uh, the king done bought it hook, line, and sinker already. Then Daniel, no, then laughed Daniel and held the king that he should not go in and said, Behold, now the pavement. Mark well whose footsteps are these. And the king said, I see the footsteps of men, women, and children. The king was very angry. Right? So uh, Daniel laid out some ashes so that it would track on their footsteps. And it, it literally the evidence, the footprints, right? And took the priest with their wives and children who showed him the privy doors where they came in and consumed such things as were upon the table. So they, they come clean. Once uh, the king said, look, I know it's you. I see your footprints. Therefore, the king slew them and delivered Baal into Daniel's power, who destroyed him and his temple. And in that same place, there was a great dragon, which they of Babylon worshipped. And the king said unto Daniel, wilt thou also say that this is of brass? Lo, he liveth and eateth. Lo, he, lo, he liveth, he eateth and drinketh. Thou cannot say that he is no living God, therefore worship him, right? This dragon that Babylon set up. Then said Daniel unto the king, I will worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. The king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and did cleave them together and made lump, lumps thereof, right? So he knew that this dragon was working off like gears and... uh mechanics on the inside of it right so he, he he got something that would uh get caught up in the gears and you know destroy the machine all right 
um, made lumps thereof. This he put in the dragon's mouth, and so the dragon burst in sunder. And Daniel said, Lo, these are the gods you worship. He said, Look, these are no gods. This what you worship? My God is the one who's given me this wisdom to do this. All right? Uh, when they of Babylon heard that, they took great indignation and conspired against the king, saying, The king has become a Jew, and he had destroyed Baal. He had slain the dragon and put the priest to death. Well, if they were <laughs> if they were worth worship, then they wouldn't be able to be destroyed. But of course, they don't say it like that. They say, "Oh, we like our traditions." So they came to the king and said, "Deliver us, Daniel, or else we will destroy thee and thine house." So they came to King Cyrus, pissed off. They said, "Look, we're going to destroy your whole palace if you don't give us Daniel." Now, when the king saw that they pressed him sore, being constrained, he delivered Daniel unto them, who cast him into the lion's den, where he was six days. So in the days of Darius, he went in there one night. In the days of Cyrus, he went in there six days. All right? And in the den, there were seven lions, and they had given them every day two carcasses and two sheep, which then were not given to them to the intent they might devour Daniel. So not only uh, is Daniel in there seven days, He's in there with lions who hadn't eaten in that time period. Now, there was in Jewry a prophet called Habakkuk. And we know we have the book of Habakkuk in the Bible, who had made pottage and had broken bread in a bowl and was going into the field for to bring it to the reapers, right, to give it to workers, right? But the angel of the Lord said unto Habakkuk, Go, carry the dinner that thou hast into Babylon unto Daniel, who is in the lion's den. And Habakkuk said, Lord, I never saw Babylon. Neither do I know where the den is. So Habakkuk's like, I, I know I know you're trying to give me a mission here, Lord, but I don't know how to get to Babylon. I don't know where Daniel is, much less how long it's going to take, right? Then the angel of the Lord took him by the crown and bare him by the hair of his head, and through the vehemency of his spirit set him in Babylon over the den, right? So God grabbed him by the head and moved him to Babylon forcefully, all right? Right, so it, it, this could have been an instantaneous thing. It could have been like wind flying through his face. You know, who knows? It's only God, right? Um, and Habakkuk cried, saying, "Oh, Daniel, Daniel, take the dinner which God hath sent thee." Right, so Habakkuk, he's freaking out because he's never been through nothing like this in his life. This is either teleportation or this is like hundreds of miles an hour. This is something he's never experienced before. So now he's now he's there. He's looking around. Daniel, take the dinner, please take the dinner. Oh, wow. Verse 38. And Daniel said, Thou hast remembered me, O God. Neither hast thou forsaken them that seek thee and love thee. So Daniel rose and did eat. And the angel of the Lord set Habakkuk in his own place again immediately. Upon the seventh day, the king went to bewail Daniel. And when he came to the den, he looked in. And behold, Daniel was sitting. So on the seventh day, a week of being in the lion's den. Cyrus assumes Daniel's dead by now because it's been seven days in a den with hungry lions. He should be dead. Right, but Daniel's just in there chilling. All right, then cried the king with a loud voice, saying, "Great art, Lord God of Daniel, and there is none other beside thee." And he drew him out and cast those that were in the cause, or oh, excuse me, and cast those that were the cause of his destruction into the den, and they were devoured in a moment before his face. So, I said Daniel was very important in history. All right. Let's go to First Esdras. I believe at the end of uh, First Esdras it says this. Mm, no, might be. Uh, there we go. So in the first year, Daniel only lived into the first year of Cyrus, the king of the Persians. All right. And as it says here, in the first year of Cyrus, king of the Persians, that the word of the Lord might be accomplished that he had promised by the mouth of Jeremiah. The Lord raised up the spirit of Cyrus, king of the Persians, and made a proclamation through all his kingdom and also by writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king, Cyrus, king of the Persians, the Lord of Israel, the Most High Lord, hath made me king of the whole world, and commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Jewry. So why, why is Cyrus being this nice? Why is Cyrus being this, this kind to the Jews? It's because he saw what the God of Israel had done through Daniel. So he said, oh, this is the real God. We have to build his temple again 
I have to send the Jews back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple again so that the only real God can take his holy vessels and put them where they need to be. Cyrus didn't just become this devout overnight. It's because he witnessed it firsthand through the prophet Daniel. 